Sponsored by Audible. Hello, my beautiful watchers. It is your boy, Dominic Noble, back at it again with the book reviews. Uh, yes, that actually felt very natural. I'm definitely going to make that my new opener from now on. Anyway, let's talk about Raybearer. Published August 18th, 2020, Raybearer is the first full novel from American author Jordan E. Freco and encompasses the first very eventful 20 years or so in the life of a young lady called Taris Sai in an African-inspired fantasy empire in the magical world of Aritzar. I'm about to put a lot of words in the author's mouth. I do have citations for all of it, but if I accidentally misrepresent her original meaning, apologies in advance. Noticing that most famous fantasy settings tended to be extremely Eurocentric, and as the daughter of two Nigerian immigrants whose ancestry traced back to different tribes within the nation, Ifreko wanted to tell the story of a fictional kingdom that reflected her heritage instead. In interviews, she's talked about trying to find the balance between making it clear she's taking influence from African culture and making it a unique world with its own customs and history. Interestingly, she apparently faced pressure from publishers to make it more recognizably African, as that was how they'd chosen to market it. Ifreko is apparently the chosen one of authors because she was headhunted by a publishing agent who was impressed with her short stories. When he asked if she had anything else to show him, she sent him the first few chapters of a novel that she had been working on since she was 13 years old, the book that would eventually become Raybearer. So, getting right down to the biscuits, this book is... Really, really good, you guys. It was another unexpected hit that kind of blew me away. For starters, this is some Anne McCaffrey, G to the RR Martin level world building, both in the fascinating depth of the world created and how naturally the exposition is worked into the story. The themes include challenging the mindset behind history's treatment of women, found families, devotion, overcoming hate with love, and fighting demons, both psychological and literal. Let me give you the history of the setting, the Arid Empire, because, well, honestly, just because it's really cool. There were once 13 kingdoms on distant separate islands, all with their own distinct cultures and practices. The one thing that they all had in common was they were plagued by attacks from Ibiku, terrifying demons and spirits from the underworld laying waste to their nations and slaughtering their people. Eventually, a noble ruler of one of the most powerful kingdoms, a gentleman by the name of Enoba, connected the islands into a supercontinent using unbelievably powerful magic and, through either military might or diplomacy, conquered all but one of the other nations. Enoba then used his united empire to fight the armies of the underworld to a standstill until they agreed upon a harsh but bearable peace treaty. His descendants then ruled for, uh, I, I think, hundreds of years. I couldn't quite figure out the exact timeline. Supposedly by divine right, as proven by their continued display of magical powers. An example of which is their unique form of protection. For every friend that he anoints to his inner council, the emperor or crown prince gains an immunity to some form of death violence, fire, poison, falling, that sort of thing. Once he has one person sworn to him from each of the 11 nations under his rule, he is immune to everything except old age. It's not as simple as it sounds, as for the ceremony to work, each council member has to genuinely love him. It can be romantic or platonic, but he has to work to forge relationships with each of them. This is usually arranged by the preceding emperor, recruiting a ton of hopefuls at a very early age, so they grow up with his young prince as a close-knit family. As mentioned, the protagonist of the story is a young woman named Taris Saar. Her mother is a mysterious, powerful figure known as The Lady, who wishes to assassinate the Emperor's heir to end his line. Of course, it's a tad hard to kill someone who's immune to everything, but there is a loophole she hopes to exploit, as the Emperor has no magical protection whatsoever if the attack comes from one of his beloved council members. So, as you can guess, the plan is Magical Sleeper Agent. She captures an Eru, uh, basically a genie bound to grant wishes to his master, and forces him to conceive a child with her, who, being half Eru, inherited the compulsion to grant her mother a wish. The lady has her daughter raised to be intelligent, skilled, kind, and completely ignorant of the plan. Then, when she's ten, she uses her wish to program her to kill the crown prince Deo when he truly loves her and lets his guard down, before sending her off to audition to become one of his council. I'm going to try to leave it there when it comes to the plot, because 
because I really want you guys to read this book, but you can probably deduce that Tar desperately trying to fight her magical programming and not be forced to kill is a big recurring plot element of the rest of the book. But seriously, please read this book. Do it for me, my beautiful watchers. I don't play this card often, but I suffered through the entire Twilight Saga for you. You owe me. Another fun aspect of the world is People's Hallows. I hesitate to make this comparison because it really doesn't do it justice, but the easiest way of conveying the concept is it's a bit like the quirks in My Hero Academia. Some people are born with unique superhuman abilities. One person can fly, another can force you to tell the truth, one fascinating character called Kira can sing things into existence. Taurus Sai's Hallow is the ability to touch people's memories through physical contact. She can see them, take them, give you some of hers. It also works on objects, so she can draw stories out of people's belongings or from the ground itself if needs be. There's a funny moment when she's trying to read the history of an ancient drum that's been in storage for centuries and she's like, yeah, sorry. Most of its memories involve spiders. Prince Deo, as a fictional character, turned out to be fascinating to me because, based on his archetype, I would have expected not to like him, but I did. The archetype in question being he's so freaking nice and progressive and trusting and pure, he is clearly too good for this world. In my experience, this kind of wonderfully nice character is very prone to being one dimensional, tropey, and cliche, yet somehow it kind of just works for this guy. Probably because it's a rare case of these potentially annoying aspects being pretty well balanced with other character flaws and noticeable character development. It also would have been so easy for the story to treat him as a MacGuffin, the reason that Tar does the heroic things that she does, like a gender-flipped knight and personalityless princess, but that too is avoided. He's a character with his own agency and arc. He's also not naive, which helps a lot. His belief in people's goodness comes from his indomitable spirit, not a lack of world experience. The predictable trope of him being set up as a sweet cinnamon roll in the first act, only for him to fall from grace as he gets jaded over time, showing that the only reason he was nice in the first place was to add some element of tragedy to his villainy, is completely silent stepped as well. Don't get me wrong, I don't think he would have made a very good protagonist, but as a supporting cast member, he worked quite nicely here. Okay, so fun fact, your boy Dom absolutely detests love triangles. I am so done with them. So when I thought I saw one developing in this story, I was gripped with an inescapable sense of dread. Tara and Dio grow to be crazy close, and while she insists that they are just friends, everyone around them just nods and winks in the sort of, oh yeah, well, we'll see when your older kind of way, but wait. Tar develops feelings for Sanjeet, one of the other council members. Oh god, here it comes. Here comes the bloody love triangle. But no. Dio comes out as being romantically and sexually ace and is perfectly happy for Tar and Sanjeet, proving they really were just friends and all these smug fantasy shippers were just plain wrong. So, blessedly spared the love triangle and asexual representation. Hallelujah. Each one of the 13 nations in the story is based on an actual African region. Ifreko mentioned in one of her interviews that it was really difficult to find unbiased historical information about them because in recent centuries a bunch of European nations, especially Great Britain, colonized the shit out of them and intentionally erased almost all of their history and culture. In a stroke of genius, she ended up turning this to her advantage and using this kind of erasure in her story. A big conflict of the book arises from the dominant empire trying to force unity and assimilation on its vassal states by destroying their written history and storytellers. The lady is yet another fascinating character. I really thought she was just going to be a hate sink, but she got seriously nuanced as the story went on. Unfortunately, no matter how sympathetic she becomes, she's still a very realistic depiction of an abusive, highly manipulative parent. She never uses her daughter's name, only referring to her as Maid of Me. It becomes very clear that she only sees her as an extension of herself. Every very justified complaint that Tar makes towards her is flipped and used to make Tar feel guilty and forces her to beg for forgiveness. You learn this is very much a cycle of abuse that she picked up from her childhood, but fortunately it's broken by one of 
of the other major themes of the story, which is the love and support that can come from the family that you choose. Okay, next super cool but kind of dark world element, the treaty with the underworld. The terms were rough, I'm not gonna lie. Every year, 300 children are supposedly chosen at random and magically marked with blue maps that appear all over their bodies. These children have been selected to be redemptors, which is a cool word for human sacrifices. At age 10, they have to jump into a rift in space-time into the underworld to satisfy the Ibiku's desire to torture mortals. The maps on their bodies can potentially lead them back to the land of the living, but very few make it, and those that do are haunted for life. Avoiding going into spoilery detail, but there's a twist to this whole thing that makes it even more unpleasant and suspicious. There's a battle scene in this book that I want to gush about briefly, because as a basic nerd bro, I do love me a good battle scene, and Efueko just has that surprisingly rare ability to write a damn good battle scene. Ugh, this book is so good it's almost offensive. It's very easy to write underwhelming or unengaging battles. You can either take too much of an overview, leaving the reader feeling disconnected from it, or you can make it too personal and leave them feeling like they might as well have read a one-on-one -on -one fight for all the awareness they have of the goings on around them. Really good authors, like one of my personal favorites, Bernard Cornwell, find that wonderful balance of writing from the perspective of someone involved who has personal shit to do, but are also so somewhat aware of the thing as a whole. She also captured the fast-paced, confusing, visceral horror of it, and again reminding me of Bernard Cornwell, she included the historically very accurate fact that shit can go from, wow, this is actually going okay for us, to, oh bugger, we are totally screwed in a single moment. If Reco mentioned Gail Carson was one of her influences, specifically the two princesses of Bermire, but you can totally see some Ella Enchanted in this story too, the compulsion to grant someone's wish being the obvious example, along with some fairy tale tropes versions. Ray Bear includes some similar themes mentioned in the review of The Charmed Wife, about how letting go of your anger and overcoming your inner demons instead of avenging yourself on your tormentor can be the greatest victory you can have over them, and it was presented in a way less depressing way, so that was nice for me. I love Tara as a protagonist because, like so many other things in this book, she hits that sweet spot of exactly how I like my fictional characters. Flawed, but likeable. She's super admirable, she always tries her best, and she does really well, but she's not perfect. In fact, she makes two major mistakes that have terrible consequences. They're understandable mistakes, but she has to own them. I've mentioned variations of the word balance all the way through this review, and I really do think it's the key to success here. You can also see it in how well the book maintains its world building while keeping the personal journey aspect front and center as well. It's almost Ursula K. Le Guin level. Can I also just say how much I love this cover? Give me color cover artists, I'm starving for it. If going to a bookstore was still a thing, I would have been drawn to this like a moth to a flame. This isn't a negative as much as it is a your mileage may vary. The story does have an overarching plot, but it's divided up into different distinct segments that each have their own short-term quests, goals, and three-act structure. It's a bit like the Fellowship of the Ring in that way, but it's a lot shorter, so it can feel a little rushed in places. Though, like I said, this is not an inherent negative. You might actually prefer it, if you like your plots to keep up a fast pace throughout. My only personal indisputable negative isn't even the author's fault. Due to past book-related trauma, I have been left somewhat hypersensitive to the word murmur. And unfortunately, this appears to be one of this author's crutch words. Finally, this book is the first in a series. The sequel, Redemptor, comes out this August 17th. I have already pre-ordered it. If Freco went the route of resolving almost all of the plots that she started in this novel by the end, then setting up what the next quest will be about in the final chapters. I suspect this might have been in case the publishers didn't jump at a sequel, so we may start seeing more through plots in later novels. Thank you for joining me, my beautiful watchers. Don't forget to do all those good YouTuber watcher things like commenting, sharing, subscribing, and and checking out my Patreon page for more sweet Dom-related content. And again, the thesis of this presentation is read this book. If you require further encouragement, um, how about if you get it and tweet to me about it, I'll give you a crisp digital high-five gif. Yeah.
There's even a way to get this story for free, which conveniently leads me to this video's sponsor. Audible is an online repository of audiobooks that has an unrivaled selection of amazing stories to choose from, and yes, that does include today's subject of review, Ray Bearer. It's narrated by John D. Abbott Pratt, who I think gives a really good performance that matches the quality of the writing itself. If you sign up with Audible through my link, audible.com slash the DOM, or text the DOM to 500-500, you'll get a free 30-day trial and a credit that entitles you to a free audiobook of your choice. So, you could be listening to Ray Bearer right now with nary a penny spent, and the audiobook is permanently yours, even if you decide not to continue after the trial ends. The icing on the cake here is membership now comes with unlimited access to Audible Plus, and its huge selection of podcasts, audiobooks, and Audible Originals. Basically, more free stuff, which I am all about. As I've said in the past, audiobooks are a real game changer for people like me, who have trouble balancing life, workload, and getting to enjoy these stories I love, so if that resonates with you, do consider trying it out. It really is 100% commitment free. So again, that's audible.com slash the DOM or text the DOM to 500, 500 to start your trial and claim your free audiobook. Once again, thank you for tuning in, my beautiful watchers. Please take care of yourselves out there in these troubled times, and I will see you soon. love and appreciation to my patrons of honor, Shelby Holtz, Atel Spurdloff, and Kat Harker. And extra special thanks to this video's co-producer, Kate Robinson. Be sure to check out her channel for more high-quality YouTube content. A bit hard to concentrate, because once again, Sateri has decided this is the moment to latch onto my leg. Would you, would you mind? Hi, stop that. If I start randomly doing this on camera, it's uh, Sateri, I move Sateri's cat towels just over here, so it'd stop nudging my legs, so. It's not a weird thing I'm doing just off screen.